Okay, well, we uh, have a treat today. We have a, a, a great communications researcher visiting from West Virginia University, uh, Matt Valenti, who's uh, been, uh, he's been there for 12 years, uh, full professor at WVU, and one of the world's leading experts on coding theory, which we are going to be talking more about uh, next week, in fact. So um, he's giving a talk on the, the video uh, standards and modulation for digital satellite television. And uh, Matt is a graduate of a very fine institution named Virginia Tech, where he did his undergraduate and also his PhD. Um, uh, and as well, uh, Matt has won lots of teaching awards. He's a great researcher, but he's also a magnificent teacher, too. So we're in for uh, a treat. Okay. And with that, I'll just okay. turn it over to you. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you for coming. Uh, thank, thank Greg for inviting me. Um, I'm here to talk to you about satellite television. Um, before I begin, how many of you in the audience uh, subscribe to either DirecTV or DISH Network? Okay, one of you. Um, <laughs> well, here's what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about some of the standards uh, involved or that, that are behind uh, satellite television. And in particular, I'm going to focus in on the modulation and the coding. So I actually have to admit, the title is a little bit of a false advertisement. Um, I'm gonna, it says how it works. I'm not going to completely explain how it works, okay? That's more Greg's job, because you were taking a whole class on uh, satellite communications. But what I really want to do today is focus in on the modulation and the coding uh, that's used in uh, digital satellite television broadcasting. Uh, and uh, the coding is a little bit more complicated, so that's actually really the heart of the, of the talk, is the LDPC coding. Uh, that's used in the DVB-S2 uh, satellite television broadcast standard. Okay? Um, I also wanted an opportunity to share with you some of my own research. So uh, we've been doing some research where we actually were able to figure out a way to get a 1 dB gain uh, on the uh, DVB-S2 system, and I'll explain how we do that. It's using what's called constellation shaping. Okay, so a little background in terms of um, the different standards. Um, there's basically two satellite television providers in the United States, DirecTV and Dish Network. And my, the left side of the slide seems to have gotten uh, trimmed here, but I think you can, you know what the first letters of those uh, <laughs> networks are. Um, and the thing I want you to get from this slide is that satellite television is a big business. Uh, th there's a lot of subscribers uh, between the two. There's more than 30 million subscribers. Uh, there's a lot of employees, so for those of you that are in, in this class and you're thinking about what industry are you going to work in after you graduate, uh, you might want to consider uh, one of these companies or uh, their contractors. Okay? In the case of Dish Network, they don't actually own their own satellites. There's another company called EchoStar that owns the satellites, and Dish Network uh, leases uh, bandwidth from them, and that's why their market capitalization is a little bit lower. Uh, but they're, they're billion dollar companies, um, and, and, and like I said, they're, they're pretty big uh, business. Actually, I actually had an opportunity, it was about three years ago, I went out to the operations center for DirecTV. It's, it was out in uh, Laguna Beach, California, and it was during the Final Four, or not the Final Four, it was actually um, March Madness, it was the first uh, day of basketball games. So there were like 16 games going on at the same time, and they had this big bank of monitors, and you could see all the games. And I had to get an engineer to make sure that we got the West Virginia game, because it was on at that, at that time. Okay, so in terms of standards, um, satellite television is uh, it's standardized under the digital video broadcasting family of standards. Now, DVB is it's, it's a standard, but it's also a consortium. So there's um, actually 270 members in the DVB consortium, and the standards themselves are actually uh, published by ETSI, the European uh, Telecommunications Standards Institute. So DVB is used more than just in the United States. It's actually used worldwide for a lot of different uh, systems. And it's more than just satellite. So there's a families of uh, systems. There's some satellite, cable, and terrestrial standards. And in the area of satellite, there's uh, two satellite broadcasting standards, uh, DVB-S and DVB-S2, which we'll talk about today. And there's a newer standard called DVB-SH. And the idea behind that is actually to give you internet download from a satellite to your handheld. So imagine your iPhone, you can get very high rate 
um, downlink speed through the iPhone, and then your uplink speed could be through the um, your uplink could still be through the cellular tower. Okay. All right. So here's DVB-S. This is the um, original technology. This came out in 1994, at the same time that uh, Directv and, and Dish Networks were originally uh, launching their first satellites. And in terms of the modulation and the coding, uh, what you have is for coding, it's a concatenation of an outer Reed-Solomon code and an inner convolutional code. And that was a popular way to do coding and for satellite communications for many years. Uh, Reed-Solomon codes, of course, those are the same types of codes that you use in your CD or your DVD player. And they encode uh, not on a bit byte basis, but by a, on a byte basis. So here, uh, when you say 204 comma 188, that actually says it's 188 uh, data bytes gets encoded into a code word, which is 204 uh, code bytes. Okay, so if you want to know how long that is in bits, just multiply by eight. Okay, modulation was just QPSK, and it used uh, raised cosine roll-off um, filtering. I'll talk about that later with 0.35 uh, roll-off. Okay, so now fast forward uh, another uh, nine years. Uh, DVB-S2 uh, was um, introduced in 2003. It was ratified in 2005. And the goals of DVB-S2 were, well, first of all, they want to improve on DVB-S. So they want to have a higher spectral efficiency. Uh, the goal was a 30% better uh, spectral efficiency. And the way that uh, they were going to do that is through better modulation encoding. And there are some modulations that were considered QPSK. Um, of course, they would maintain. Uh, it was also in DVB-S. 8PSK and um, these mo Amplitude phase shift keying, uh, we'll talk about what those are. Uh, and then for the coding, um, there was some consideration in using turbo codes. And back in 2000, I actually um, in investigated looking at turbo codes for DVB-S. Uh, but the conclusion was um, that actually LDPC codes were, were better suited uh, for, the, for the system. Now, those of you that know coding theory, you know that both turbo codes and LDPC codes are capacity approaching. And then the, in addition to improving the performance, they also wanted the ability to uh, offer a more diverse range of services. So besides the traditional broadcast television, and of course by having improved performance, they'd be able to support HD TV, uh, but they also wanted to have um, some backhaul applications. So for instance, a news reporter goes out uh, to a remote location and would like to be able to have a high def news feed, uh, and there's no local uh, infrastructure to do that. Maybe they're um, someplace on the other side of the world, Afghanistan or something like that, that doesn't have a real good infrastructure, uh, then they have a backhaul for that. Um, internet downlink access, and this is really important for people who might not uh, be in an uh, urban area with a lot of uh, uh, options for internet access. Uh, you can get people who are in rural areas internet at high speed uh, using a satellite for the downlink. I'll explain that in a minute. And the other thing is large-scale data content, so maybe having some common data that's given to the subscribers, like maybe a digital newspaper or something like that. Now here's the idea behind adapt, uh, the internet uh, downlink. It's actually an adaptive internet downlink. So you have your um, <coughs> satellite over here. It provides a downlink to the user, okay? Uh, but it's not really very convenient for the user to go up. There is a standard, by the way, called DVB-RCS, which is, stands for Return uh, Channel Satellite, which does allow the user to transmit up to the satellite, but it's a very expensive technology. So it's more feasible. And of course, most people, for typical um, internet applications, you have more downlink than, than uplink. If you're browsing the web or whatever, you're going to have a lot more coming down than going up. So if the return link is just through a standard um, telephone line. Okay? And then, um, so that's how you complete the, the loop. Now the interesting thing is, because you have this return channel, there's an opportunity to adapt the link. Because the receiver can measure the channel quality, and it can report back to the control center uh, how good the channel is. And so if it has a good channel, it can uh, afford to increase the data rate. Or if it's a bad channel, it can throttle the data rate back. OK, so let's talk about some of the uh, details of how uh, these uh, systems work, especially in terms of the modulation and the coding. OK, so. Um, there was uh, an attempt to uh, get 16 uh, QAM uh, working, uh, but there's a problem with uh, 16 QAM for satellite channels. So uh, for 16 QAM, of course, you've got 16 uh, signals. This is uh, you know, your constellation diagram. You've, you guys have seen these before. And so you've got the in phase and the quadrature part. 
And uh, you could kind of think of it as uh, determining what the cosine and the sine carrier is. Uh, or equivalently, uh, the magnitude would just be you know, the distance to the origin and then the, and the phase would be the angle. So you can, you can convey information through magnitude and phase. And with 16 QAM, everything's arranged in a nice uh, grid. Uh, but when you have a nonlinear channel, and this is a problem with satellite communications. Um, for instance, you, you, on the satellite itself, you may have a TWTA, uh, traveling wave tube amplifier. And what happens is and it, it would tend to be operating kind of near saturation. So the signals of highest energy, which would be the ones here in the corner, actually don't get amplified as much as the other signals. So what happens is um, when they're amplified, they kind of get pulled in a little bit. See here, these guys get pulled in. And actually, the, the signals in the middle might actually get pushed out a little for similar reasons. So you have this uh, warping of the constellation, uh, which makes it you're either harder to demodulate or you're just going to have uh, a degradation in performance because the signal points are closer together. Right? So rather than trying to force a square peg into a round hole, uh, the idea was, well, let's just use a different modulation. Okay? So a more appropriate choice of modulation is something where phase, of course, uh, or information is encoded in phase. So you got QPSK and 8PSK. Those are natural candidates. Those have constant uh, amplitudes. So it doesn't really matter if it's a nonlinear amplitude, they a nonlinear amplifier, because you know, all these uh, signals are going to be amplified by the same amount. Uh, but you're limited in terms of the number of signal points, and hence the, the, uh, the data rate if you limit yourself to 8PSK. So to get to higher, um, higher spectral efficiencies, what they use is these constellations, 16 and 32 APSK. So APSK stands for amplitude phase shift keying. And then the idea here is, in fact, the 16 APSK almost looks like the warped 16 QAM constellation. Uh, the idea here is um, to have two concentric circles, one with four points and the other one with 12 points. And then to get more spectral efficiency, you have uh, 32 APSK with three circles, with four, 12, and 16 signal points. And so now you've got only a, a, a discrete number of amplitudes uh, to have to deal with. And if you go through a nonlinear amplifier, well, what happens is all the points on the same circle kind of get spread out the same amount. Okay? And so they sort of stay in the same place on the circle, and the circles just kind of get either further apart or closer together. But you know, it's easy to compensate for, the, for that in the, in the design of the receiver. Okay? So these are the modulations right here. These four modulations are the ones that are used in DVB S2. Okay, now, um, in any communication system, if you, any digital communication system, if you just transmit square pulses, uh, you know, square pulse, think back to your um, you know, signals and systems class. If you have a rectangle and you take the Fourier transform of it, you get a sync, right? A sync uh, function in, in frequency. And that actually has an infinite uh, bandwidth, right? The, the, uh, the absolute bandwidth of something that's a rectangular function in, in time is going to be infinite in frequency. So, um, there needs to be some filtering to control the bandwidth. And what's commonly done, and you may have seen this in your communications classes, is to use raised cosine roll-off filtering. Or more specifically, root raised cosine roll-off, because you want to have a uh, raised cosine roll-off um, transfer function, and you, and you do half of it at the transmitter and the other half at the receiver. Okay? And so um, the bandwidth is controlled by a parameter alpha. This is sort of an excess bandwidth beyond uh, the theoretical minimum that you need uh, and the minimum is actually uh, just from Nyquist is, is half the sample, the, half the symbol period um, at baseband. At RF, it would be equal to the symbol period. So in other words, you could transmit one mega baud per second over one megahertz using ideal Nyquist signaling. But um, if you use raised cosine roll-off, um, Nyquist signaling is, is kind of idealized and requires filters with infinite um, infinitely steep uh, uh, pass bands uh, and cutoff frequencies. So raised cosine roll-off filter is more practical. And it's governed by sort of the steepness here of, you think of it as a low pass filter. And, and you've got some uh, uh, transition band here. And how steep it is governs how, how, how much bandwidth you need. Now, the DVB-S system used an, a um, raised cosine roll-off factor of 0.35. Uh, DVB-S2 uses tighter. Uh, roll off of 0.25 and, and 0.2. Okay, so let's see how this translates into bit rates. Okay, so there's actually a couple things that are going on here. Uh, we're using a, more, a tighter 
uh, race cosine roll-off filter, and we're also transmitting more bits per symbol uh, by virtue of having a larger constellation, right? So, um, for instance, if you use 32 APSK, um, there's 32 symbols, so each one of those symbols can convey 2 to the 5th, um, or 5 bits of, of information, because 2 to the 5th is, is, is 32, right? So, uh, in DVBS, if you just use QPSK, you're just, you know, constrained to transmitting 2 bits per symbol, and if you have your roll-off is 1.35, uh, that's the additional bandwidth that you need due to using race cosine roll-off filtering. If you assume a 6 megahertz uh, channel, why 6 megahertz? Well, that's the size of an analog um, television station, right? So you like to think in terms of 6 megahertz chunks when you're dealing with TV. Then over this one television channel's equivalent of bandwidth, you're going to get 8.9 megabits per second, okay? But under DVBS2, um, you can use a tighter roll-off, so you're down at alphas 0.2, and you can use up to 32 APSK, so you're now transmitting 5 bits per symbol. Uh, so you take that, 5 bits per symbol times 6 megahertz, uh, divide that by 1.2, which is the additional bandwidth you need for raised cosine roll filtering, you get 25 megabits per second. So you actually get a nice big uh, improvement there. Okay. And that's actually a lot more than 30%, right, that, that, that they're looking for. But there's a, there is a downside, okay? So the disadvantage of using 32 APSK is, and this is common, anytime you have a, a larger constellation and you don't use any sort of coding, then you take a hit in terms of your error rate. So if you have a, bit, a curve here, this is bit error rate versus the carrier to noise ratio here expressed as uh, ES over N naught, energy per symbol divided by the noise spectral density. You can see as you go from QPSK and then to 8PSK, 16 and 32, every time you have more symbols, uh, because the constellation is denser, the signals get closer, and so the error performance gets worse. And so you're going to need here an extra um, about maybe 12, 11, 12 dB to go from QPSK to 32 APSK, okay? If you don't do that, then what's going to happen is you're going to have errors, okay? Which leads us to the next topic, LDPC, coding. So we can see that you know, the channel itself is actually not real good um, when you're using 32 APSK in particular. You've got really nice spectral efficiency. You're transmitting, you have the potential to transmit a lot of bits per second, but you're going to be getting um, a lot of errors or you're going to need a lot of signal power, uh, either of which are not good uh, alternatives. So what we like to do is to improve performance by using some sort of an error control code. And of course, even DVBS used an error control code, used read Solomon and convolutional. But uh, that, that's a fairly old technology. So um, the idea in uh, DVBS2 is to update it with a more modern code, a low density parity check code. So your performance can be improved by using some sort of an error control code. Now, there is a limit to how well you can do, and that's uh, you know, governed by information theory. Uh, the uh, the uh, modulation constraint capacity, okay, so if you didn't have any constraints on the modulation, then you can just use you know, Shannon capacity, which is what? It's uh, capacity is equal to B times log 1 plus SNR, right? You've seen the, that equation before. But if, you, if you've ever seen a proof of that, of Shannon capacity, um, that proof actually assumes that the input to the channel is a Gaussian distributed input, which is not what an actual modulation is. So if you um, limit the input to be one of these signal constellations and you compute the mutual information between the input and the output and you plot it uh, as a function of SNR, you can actually get these curves. So what does this tell you? Well, this tells you um, the theoretical minimum signal to noise ratio you need for each one of these modulations as a function of the spectral efficiency. Okay? Now, I went ahead and took the liberty of putting some X's here. These X's actually correspond to the uncoded error rates that we saw on the previous curve. Uh, this would be the signal to noise ratio that you need to get a bit error rate of 10 to the minus 6 with 32 APSK. We're up here around 24 dB. Right? Now, if you were willing to reduce the spectral efficiency, so you don't require five bits per symbol, but because you're using a channel code and, and, and due to the overhead of the parity bits of the channel code, you're going to have a lower spectral efficiency. Um, if, for instance, maybe uh, you allow yourself to go down to maybe 4.5 bits per symbol, now look at this. You can actually, in theory, uh, drop uh, the required SNR by 10 dB. Okay? That would be the coding gain. Okay? Now that's, of course, the best you can do. 
Um, basically, you can't operate anywhere up here in the upper left. You can operate on the lower right. Um, and an LDPC code is good because it actually operates fairly close to these curves. Okay? So um, the idea of uh, using an LDPC code is to try to um, you know, get, the, get the required SNR down. Uh, and of course, you're going to have to have some uh, loss in rate in doing that. But we want to kind of keep that loss in rate to a minimum. OK, so um, the different combinations of modulation and code rates um, here are given in this chart here. There's actually 28 different combinations in the standard of code rate and uh, modulation. So here are the four modulations. We already saw uh, these modulations previously. Now, of course, when I say code rate, the idea is when you have a channel encoder, you're taking messages and you're encoding them into code words. And the code words, of course, are longer than the messages. And the difference is the number of parity bits, right? if you're assuming it's like a systematic code. OK, so um, just a little bit of notation here. We'll say uh, k is the length of the message. n is the length of the code word. So of course, n is greater than k. The ratio k over n is, is, the, is the code rate. Okay. Now, in DVBS2, there's actually two code word lengths, uh, and actually only two code word lengths. Uh, so that would correspond to this n. So n can be either 16,200 bits or 64,800 bits, which incidentally is quite large. Okay, uh, those are those are pretty large for those of you who use cell phones. Um, the the typical um, size of a of a um, uh, code word in a cell phone is about is like 384 bits. Okay, for for a packet over a cell phone. So these are these are fairly uh, big uh, codes, but. You see, um, that's actually one thing that comes out of information theory, is in order to get to the Shannon capacity limit, you need fairly long codes. Okay? That's another assumption that went behind you know, that, that um, Shannon um, capacity formula, that capacity is B times log 1 plus SNR. Well, that assumes that the code word's infinitely long. You know? So we want their, our code words to be pretty long. And you know what? Long code words don't really matter if you consider that you're already going to have some propagation delay in your, in your satellite channel. And you're also transmitting at a fairly high data rate. So this actually doesn't really trans translate to a very long latency or long additional latency. OK, so this chart actually shows how uh, DVB-S2 matches up against Shannon, uh, the Shannon bounds that we saw before. So see these dash curves? These are just kind of stretched out versions of those modulation constrained capacity limits that we saw on the previous slide. And then superimposed here are, uh, there's kind of a lot going on in this diagram. And this is actually from the DVB-S2 standard. Um, I, I borrowed the di this diagram from near the, the back of the standard. Um, you actually see here DVB-S. This is, this is where um, things stood with the older standard. And so you can see with DVB-S2, um, even using QPSK, the performance is improved. And that's due entirely to the better code. Right? By using the LDPC code, um, even with QPSK, you're operating much closer to the Shannon bound than, than you were with the older DVBS standard. Um, but furthermore, you actually, have, you actually have the ability to uh, operate with these other modulations with higher data rate modes. Okay? <coughs> this one here, DVB, it's called DVB DSNG. This was sort of an intermediate standard, like a 1.5 uh, G standard, if you will. It used 16 QAM. And it was actually pretty far away from the, um, or this, this here is 16 QAM uh, instead of 16 APSK. So the, there's a loss. And we already saw before why you wouldn't want to use 16 QAM. Okay? But you can see if you look at these curves and, and, and compare to look at the uh, abscissa down there, um, you know, we're operating, it's operating maybe about a dB away from uh, the theoretical uh, bound, which is, yeah, that's, that's actually pretty good. Okay? Uh, one to two dB away. Okay? Uh, there, there is some room for improvement. And like I promised before, I'm going I'm to talk about how you can improve things. Um, incidentally, I'm going to give you a little preview of what we, what we did. Uh, if you want to improve things, you really got to do two things. You, first of all, you want to get closer to the bound, right? But better yet, if you can move the bound, then that's actually better. So this idea of using constellation shaping, which I'll talk about later, actually moves the bound by a little bit. OK. All right, now I want to just talk a little bit about coding theory. Here I'm actually going to um, act as your professor for the day, because I know this is a topic of your class. And uh, so I just want to go over a little bit of basics of coding theory uh, with an emphasis on LDPC codes. Now, you know, LDPC codes are actually a pretty extensive topic. So uh, I'm not going to be able to tell you everything you need to know about LDPC codes today. And, 
And those of you that are engaged in research, you know, you may already have looked at LDPC codes. And you, you might even know more about them than I do. But um, the idea of LDPC codes, of course, starts with just a simple single parity check code. This is really the simplest code you can think of, error control code, right? So you got uh, a message here. I use U for message. One, two, three, four, five. So you got five data bits here. And really, the easiest way to encode it is to come up with a single parity bit. And the parity bit is selected to ensure even parity, right? So the number of ones here is, is even, right? And how do you find it? Well, you just basically you just take a modulo 2 sum of all the data bits, right? If, if modulo 2 sum of the, of the data bits is 1, that means there's an odd number of data bits. So your parity bit has to be a 1. And if the modulo 2 sum is a 0, well, then you have an even number of parity bits. So your, your parity bit should be a 0, right? OK, so with a single parity check code, you can detect an error in any one position. right? So any one of these bits, if, if it's wrong, that bit's going to be flipped. And when you add up the number of ones, instead of having even parity, you'll now have odd parity. Right? OK, so the problem, though, is if, if we just constrain ourselves to single parity check codes, uh, we're limited to just detecting a single error. And what we'd like to do is be able to correct errors. So if you want to correct errors, you've got to do things like this. This is a product code. Okay. So the idea of a product code is we're going to take our bits and we're going to put it in, in this case, a two by two array, and then we'll encode along each row and each column. So each row is going to get a single parity check code, and each column is going to get a single parity check code. And so um, if the, this is our message one zero one one, just encode encode along the rows and the columns, and that'll be our code word, right? And then you can actually not only detect an error, but you can actually correct it. And the way you correct it is you actually kind of pinpoint its location. So what I mean by that is um, if, you're, if you have an error here, this red uh, bit down here at the bottom, if that's an error, uh, and so it's been flipped from a 1 to a 0, then the parity check is going to fail along the second row and also the first column. right? So now you just have to look for, well, what position is at the second row and the first column, and it's that bit, and you just flip it. Okay? So you can correct any one error. Okay? Okay. But of course, we'd like to be able to correct more than just one error. So what we'd like to do is have um, a lot of uh, different parity check equations that are working together uh, in, a, in an effort to correct multiple errors. And so you can actually characterize uh, any sort of linear code here is in terms of a, a set of um, parity check equations, okay? a set of equations. So what, we, what we'll do here is we have these 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. We have these five parity bits here. Each one of those parity bits, we can have associated with it an equation. So if we look at maybe this first uh, parity bit, um, this is code bit 3. C3 is equal to C1 plus C2. It's a modulo 2 sum, of course. Okay? So we can write that as an equation. Okay? But what we'd like to do is we'd like to get this into a matrix form uh, of the form of you know, using a vector. Ve some vector times a matrix is equal to all zeros. Okay? And so what you want to do is just solve for zero. So we can have an equivalent equation which says C1 plus C2 plus C3 equals zero. Literally what I've done is I've subtracted C3 from both sides, but addition and subtraction when you're doing things modulo 2 are the same, right? Okay, so here's our first equation. So this equation here actually governs what's going on at this parity bit. And so we just sort of repeat this. For every parity bit, we can have a corresponding equation. So we call these parity check equations, okay? All right, so if you have a, a, a rate k over n code, then in general you're going to need n minus k linearly independent equations to specify the code. Okay, so the benefit of doing that, well, now we can put things into a matrix format. So we can take our code word C here. Okay, these are these. Are these C. C is just a vector whose elements are C1, C2, all the way up to Cn. And then we can multiply it by this matrix H. And uh, this matrix just is the, um, the each row of the matrix corresponds to one of these parity check equations. So for instance, our first parity check equation was C1 plus C2 plus C3 equals 0. So in matrix form, we just want to have ones in those positions. So this row says, well, C1 plus C2 plus C3, wherever there's ones, has to equal 0, and so on for all of the rows in, in the uh, parity check matrix. Okay? So we can, um, we can describe our code in terms of its parity check matrix. Okay? All right, we can also describe our code uh, graphically. Okay? And uh, this is kind of the preferred representation when you're dealing with an LDPC decoder, so-called Tanner graph, <laughs> named after uh, Mike Tanner. Uh, and the idea here is you're going to have with a Tanner graph, it's a bipartite graph 
with two different types of nodes, uh, so-called check nodes, which are the squares, and variable nodes, which are the circles. Okay? And each check node corresponds to a parity check equation, which corresponds, of course, to one row of the, of the, of the parity check equation, or the parity check matrix. And each uh, variable node corresponds to one of the variables of the equation, which um, is a column of the H matrix. Okay? So all, what, the way this works is a check node is connected to a variable node if there's a 1 in the corresponding location in the H matrix. Okay? So to see that, let's just go through. Here's our first, um, our first uh, check node right here. Okay? And uh, that corresponds to the first row of the parity check matrix. First row of the parity check matrix has ones in locations one, two, and three. So that means that the, this first check node needs to be connected to variable nodes one, two, and three. Okay. Second row is um, corresponds to the second check check node, and it's connected to variable nodes um, four, five, and six. Okay. You could also see what's going on by looking at the variable nodes. So each variable node corresponds to a column. So this first variable node, if you look at the first column, uh, there's a 1 in positions 1 and 3. So that means that this variable node needs to be connected to check node 1 and 3. Okay? So this Tanner graph is just, it's just, a, it's just another way to represent the parity check matrix. Okay, so now let's get to LDPC codes. Um, the idea here is you would like a long code. Uh, we already saw you know, or talked about how um, in order to get to the uh, Shannon capacity, you need to have long codes. And in fact, the codes used by DVBS2 are long. And uh, however, the complexity of the decoder, and the decoder is actually defined over a Tanner graph, the complexity is going to be related to the number of edges in the decoder or in the Tanner graph. Uh, and, and the reason why is the way the decoder works is it's going to send messages from the check nodes down to the variable nodes. The way you actually implement the decoder in hardware is you have a little processor that corresponds to each one of the check nodes and each one of the variable nodes. Okay? And it does a, a pretty simple operation. Uh, but there's a lot of these variable nodes. There's one variable node for every bit in, in the code word. And also there'll be a lot of check nodes. Okay? And so you want to kind of keep the... Uh, the number of operands for those processors as low as possible, and that's done by having as few edges as possible. Okay? So in order to um, reduce your complexity, you want to have a, a, a Tanner graph that has few edges, which of course corresponds to a H matrix, which has few ones, relatively few ones, or in other words, it's sparse. Right? Okay? And that's really all an LDPC code is, is it is a, it's a uh, code that has an H matrix, which is sparse, which has you know, m many uh, fewer uh, ones than, than zeros. And in fact, it's sparse in a certain way. The, um, the row and the column weights are independent of length. So if you make it longer, um, if you make your code longer, uh, you'll need a bigger matrix. But you want to keep the number or the, the weight or the number of ones in the rows and the number of ones in the columns um, the same. Okay? Uh, and, and by doing that, then the decoder complexity is only going to grow linearly with length, okay? not exponentially if the, if the number of ones in the matrix got bigger. Okay? Um, and also, it turns out that if you design an LDPC code appropriately, you can actually get good performance. You actually can achieve uh, capacity. Okay? You don't have to have a high density matrix to achieve capacity. Um, there's actually some properties of, uh, LD, of, of having low density that are actually uh, desirable. Okay? Historical note. Uh, even though um, LDPC codes are thought to be you know, modern codes and, and uh, the latest and greatest in, in coding theory, um, they actually date back to uh, Gallagher's 1960 dissertation. Uh, but at the time, uh, they're, they're actually maybe too complicated to be implemented in 1960. And so they're sort of forgotten until after turbo codes. Turbo codes, of course, came out in 1993. And then it was after turbo codes that LDPC codes were, were rediscovered. Um, and it was actually Mackay uh, and Neil. Uh, David Mackay is a professor in um, Cambridge University in physics, actually. And they, they, they rediscovered um, LDPC code. So here's an example of an LDPC code. Uh, it's kind of hard to show you a full uh, LDPC code because the matrices tend to be very large. Uh, but in this example, um, the thing to notice is that the rows all have three ones in them. So we would say that the row weight is three. And I'm sorry, four. Yeah, the rows have four. The rows have four, and the columns have three. Okay, 
And so we would call this a 3-4 regular code. Regular meaning that all of the columns have the same weight. And also all the rows have the same weight. Okay? We'll see later that although a regular LDPC code gives you good performance, you're actually better off having a so-called irregular LDPC code where the, row, where the column weights are actually different from one column to the next. And in order to achieve capacity, uh, you actually have to have an irregular uh, parity check matrix. So you, you actually don't want all of the columns to have the same weight. Okay. Okay. How are we doing on time? What time does this class end, by the way? 2.55. Okay. Okay. You see I have a lot of, well, actually I don't see it there. I have a total of 58 slides. We're about halfway through. I can speed up if, if we're running out of time. This, this part here, by the way, I will post uh, the slides. So we're getting into a, a, a part where I might go a little bit faster and, and there's some equations and details over the next maybe 10 slides. And so if, if, if you have a lapse of concentration, you can always go back and look at the slides later. Okay. And uh, Dr. Durgan didn't ask me yet for, an, for a question for the exam, but he was uh, kind of joking that he might, so I don't know. <laughs> Maybe you might see this on one of your exams. Okay. So I want to talk to you about how the decoder works. That's one thing. And I also want to talk to you a little bit about how to design an LDPC code. Okay? But in the interest of time, um, we can't really, I can't really tell you how to do this for an arbitrary channel. So we're going to limit ourselves to probably what's the simplest channel uh, to think of. Uh, at least in terms of, of LDPC coding, which is called the, the binary erasure channel. Okay? So the idea of a binary erasure channel is, as the name implies, you got 0 and 1 going in, and with a certain probability, epsilon, it becomes erased, E. Okay? Uh, with 1 minus E, you get the correct bit. Notice there's no errors, but what you get is an erasure. So an erasure is um, you know that there's an error, but you just don't know what it is. Okay? Um, you, you receive something, you know something's wrong with it, but you don't know whether it was a zero or a one. Uh, what, one way you could implement this in a receiver is maybe you have um, uh, two decision thresholds. And if you're above one decision threshold, you can say with almost certainty that it was a one. If you're below another one, you could say with almost certainty that it's zero. And if you're sort of in between, then you could say, well, I don't know, and just declare that it's an erasure. Okay. Um, erasure channels are also used to model what happens in the internet because a lot of times in the internet what you're worried about is not bit errors but packed, uh, dropped packets. So if you drop a packet, you know that the packet's dropped, you just don't know what was in it. So you can just declare that as an, as an erasure. Okay? Um, but more importantly, it's, uh, it helps to uh, illuminate some of the concepts uh, related to LDPC codes. And if you're, if you're interested in LDPC codes, you can kind of go back and reconsider everything I'm talking about here. You can redo for like an AWGN or a fading channel. It's just uh, a little bit, more, little bit more detail, but the basic concepts are the same. Okay, so now when you have erasures, an erasure channel, you actually have an opportunity now to um, decode more than just one error. Remember when we had this uh, product code, uh, really we, all we could do with our product code was correct one error. But when, now when you have erasures, you actually have uh, an opportunity to um, correct multiple of erasures because an erasure is not as severe as an error. Okay? All right, so the way you do it is um, we're going iteratively, to iteratively go through the parity check equations row by row and column by column until we've got them all corrected. So first thing we want to do is go through, look at our, so this is our received uh, message. Notice we actually have one, two, three, four, five. We have five erasures, uh, actually more erasures than we have correct bits. Okay? All right, so we're going to go through. Now, just like a single parity check code, you can correct one error, right? So looking at this uh, received code, or if we look at the rows, we can't do anything about the first row yet. Second row, there's one error, so we can correct that. That E, in order to assure even parity, that E has to be a one. So we can correct it. Uh, third row, well, we're out of luck. We can't do anything with that because there's two erasers. Now we're going to go and go down the columns. So let's go down each one of these columns. The first column now has one, has one E in it. Uh, so we know we can correct that. We know that should be a 1. Uh, can't do anything about the second column but the third, because it has two erasers. But the third column uh, has one erasure, so we can correct that. Okay? And now we can go back and redo the rows. Interesting thing happens. Uh, whereas we couldn't correct the first row previously, uh, we can now. And the reason why is because that first uh, entry of the row has now been corrected. So now we only have one erasure, so we can correct it. It becomes a zero. And uh, also the last 
uh, the last row, which previously we couldn't correct, it has one, now it only has one erasure, so we can correct it. So we've actually corrected the whole thing, okay? And we did it iteratively by going through the uh, rows and the columns multiple times, uh, multiple passes, until either we've corrected them all or we're sort of in a deadlock and we, we can't correct anymore, okay? But, you know, for LDPC codes, we, we can't always guarantee that the structure is a nice square product code like in the last example. So what we would rather do is do our erasure decoding on the Tanner graph, okay? And so this is a Tanner graph for the exact same code as what we had before, okay? The parity check matrix, I didn't say it, but maybe it was obvious to you, that parity check matrix that we looked at before was for this product code. Okay, so this Tanner graph is a Tanner graph for the product code. Okay, so what we want to do is use the Tanner graph to do our decoding, and the way it works is you just you load up the variable nodes down here with the received bits. So this is just uh, reading from that matrix row by row. We just stuff them in here. Okay, you can see where the erasures are. There's still one, two, three, four, five erasures, right? And now what we're going to do is at each, each check node here, we're just going to, um, at the check node, each check node, we're going to attempt to um, correct, okay? And we can correct at any given check node if there is exactly one erasure. If there's more than one erasure, we can't correct it, right? Because the idea of a parity check equation, the parity check equation says that all of the um, bits connected to it have to sum to, to zero, right? That's, that's what a parity check equation is. Each parity, each check node corresponds to one parity check equation in um, the code, okay? So um, if there's a single erasure, then you just pick that erasure, set that erasure to whatever um, bit value assures even parity. If there's two erasures, there's nothing you can do about it. Uh, but we're gonna pass through this multiple times. Uh, because even though even though we can't do anything about these erasures um, in the first pass, these erasures are connected to other check nodes. So maybe the, check, the other check nodes that they're connected to can do something about them. If they're not both connected to the same check node, then you should hopefully be able to uh, correct them. Okay? Um, now there's some words here. The, the actual algorithm um, operates using messages, and a message um, is literally um, the way it works is um, this check node is going to send a message down to um, the variable node. It basically takes the um, exclusive or, or adds the values of the incoming uh, variable nodes and then sends it down to the other variable node. Okay? And if the one, any one of these messages is an erasure, then, it, then what it's going to send down there is an erasure. But like over here, um, where's, where's an example? Um, maybe here. It's connected to, actually, this is not a good example because I've got too many errors. But um, I'll go ahead and we'll, we'll go through and decode this using the Tanner graph, okay? All right, so we're going to start. In the first check node, there's nothing we can do. There's two erasures. But we can go to the second check node. And in the check, second check node, there's um, only one erasure. So that erasure needs to be set to one, right? That erasure is set to one to assure even parity. And then we'll go to this one here and go to this uh, check node, and um, we had one error. Yeah, the, the error down there, there's one error, so that's um, set to one, and then we're gonna go over here. We can't do anything here yet because there's multiple errors. Uh, this one here uh, is gonna correct, which one? This one down here, one, okay? And then we're gonna go back to the beginning and see, you know, repeat, see if we can correct some more erasures. Now, we go back to this first check node, sure enough, we can correct uh, this, this, uh, this guy. And then this one here can correct uh, that erasure. So, so going through it uh, iteratively, maybe multiple passes, um, you'll hopefully be able to get all of them uh, corrected. Okay. However, there are there is a limitation. The limitation is what's called a stopping set. So uh, you could have a situation where you have um, erasures in certain positions that, no matter how many iterations you go through, you can't correct them. Okay. That's called a stopping set. Okay, there's some graphic graph theory stuff down here. I have to um, be honest, this, this portion of my talk I first gave to the math department at, at my university and I felt compelled to talk about um, um, neighbors and all this graph theory lingo stuff here, okay? So you can look at this later, but the idea here is um, you can find a set of nodes that um, if they're all set to erasures, there's nothing you can do to correct it. So this is an example. Um, so here, I've removed the other uh, variables because they don't, they don't matter. But here, the problem is 
every one of these check nodes in here is connected to two erased variables. And anytime you have uh, a check node connected to two erased variables, you, you can't do anything about it. You can't correct it. So this is called a stopping set, and this is ultimately what limits the performance of an LDPC code. And it can impose a, an error floor. Uh, even, in a, uh, even when you're not operating over a uh, erasure channel, if you're operating even over an AWGN channel, uh, stopping sets are something uh, to worry about and something that can cause um, an error floor. For AWGN channels, sometimes people are more concerned with uh, a similar uh, concept, which is called a trapping set. Okay? It's basically, the, in, in essence, the same idea. Okay. So we can actually apply a little bit of um, analysis to this problem. Uh, in order to predict the performance, this idea called density evolution. Okay, and so the idea is you think of the erasure probability as a random variable, and you want to uh, tr track how the density or the probability density function of that random variable evolves, changes as the decoder iterates. Okay, and uh, really all you need to do when you have an erasure channel is you just want to keep track of what is the erasure probability as a function of the number of iterations through the graph, okay? So one iteration would be like one pass through all of the check nodes. That's one iteration. So uh, there's an equation here. This is, this is something where um, I don't really feel like going through all the details of where this equation comes from. Uh, but you can actually come up with this yourself. It's, it's pretty straightforward probability. Uh, thinking in terms of, well, you, you know the logical conditions of how um, at a check node, all of the um, bits except for one um, need to be correct, okay? And so you get some conditions like all but one, all but one, DC minus one need to be correct, right? And then that tells you the probability of an error here. Similar condition ap applies uh, at the variable nodes. Um, the, the true uh, message passing algorithm actually executes steps at both the check nodes and the variable nodes. So just, you know, applying some basic probability theory, you get an equation like this. What does it say? Well, E0, that's your initial erasure probability. This is the erasure probability of the channel. Okay, so that's the initial, uh, initially all of the variables nodes are erased with probability epsilon zero. Okay, so that's initial. And then, and then we have epsilon L is the erasure probability after the elth iteration, okay? And it's just a recursion. So uh, the error probability after the elth iteration depends on the initial uh, erasure probability and the erasure probability of the L minus one uh, uh, recursion, okay? So um, I, I have a proof here, proof, uh, it's two pages. Um, one, f one that comes up with this part of the equation and then another one that comes up with this equation. And um, I'll let you look at that on your own uh, if, you're, if you're interested. But I want to kind of get to, um, you know, what do we do with this? Okay, so this is using density evolution. This is a rate one half. Uh, this 3.6 LDPC code, the 3.6 LDPC code that we were looking at previously. Um, there's a couple of assumptions that go on here. One is it, the, it's assumed that the messages are independent, which um, actually has an implied um, assumption that the graph has a very wide girth, meaning it doesn't sort of wrap in on itself when you, when you iterate up and down the graph. And it also kind of has an, an assumption that it's a very big graph, okay? But those assumptions actually are, are pretty fair for an LDPC code. Because remember, an LDPC code is generally large, and so the graph would be big. And because of the low density properties, um, the, the so-called girth of the graph can usually be pretty large. And, and you, can, you can design a code in such a way that it has you know, the, the girth that you want it to have. Um, you know, I'm using a, a, a graph theory term, girth, <laughs> there. Um, but anyway. Um, here's, um, as a function of the number of iterations, then what you do is you seed this equation, the equation that I'm showing here is this equation, seed it with a value of ep epsilon zero, and then just track what the value of epsilon L is as a function of the number of iterations. Okay, what do you get? Um, well, if your initial erasure probability is too high, like 0 0.7, 0 0.6, or 0.5, then, well, it goes down a little bit, but then it kind of hits a floor and it never drops to zero. However, there's a critical point and it's somewhere between 0.4 and 0.5. It's probably around 0.42 or so, where it no longer hits a floor. And here you can see, uh, for erasure probability 0.4, the uh, erasure probability as you go through the iterations drops until until it reaches zero. And at that point, then uh, the erasures are are corrected. What that tells you is that if you have a very large code, then with um, high certainty, 
um, you will be able to correct the erasures in that code. Okay. Okay. So. Um, so the downsteady evolution, it kind of describes an asymptotic performance. It's not going to tell you how the performance of a particular code works, but an ensemble of codes. So we were looking at you know, the performance of an ensemble of three, six uh, regular LDPC codes. Okay? Um, so you still have to actually design the code. Okay? Once, you've, once you've figured out, okay, well, you know, you've had an understanding of how it's going to behave, you still need to design it. So how do you design it? Well, you want to um, make sure, well, you, your H matrix, you want to make sure it's full rank, or else you're going to have some extra equations in there which depend on previous equations which actually should be removed and in essence you actually have a smaller H matrix than you think, right? So the code rate's not going to be as, um, as high as, as, as what you were planning on it to be. Uh, you want to avoid having uh, small minimum stopping sets. So the, these, remember these stopping sets back here? Um, you know, it's unavoidable that you're going to have some stopping sets, but you just want to make the stopping sets that are there as big as possible because then you need a lot of erasures in order to hit those stopping sets. Okay? And then the other thing is, is uh, the girth. So in other words, um, you have a, um, a basically a loop if you go up and down and you come back again. Um, you want to try to make the, um, minimize these cycles. A cycle would be, uh, let's see if I can find a cycle in here. Um, a cycle is any time you start in a given variable node and you end up in the same variable node. Okay? So you want to try to minimize or actually maximize the minimum cycle length. Okay? And that is useful or helpful because it assures this, um, you know, this assumption of having uh, independent messages that we used in the density evolution. Okay? So those are all some, some conditions that are used you know, to design the actual uh, parity check matrix. Okay? And so there's some comments here as to why, why we would want to do those things. Okay. So here uh, we actually designed an actual L LDPC code. It's a 3.6 regular LDPC code. The length is 8,000 bits. And we just put it through this binary erasure channel. And here's the erasure probability. We just did a, like a Monte Carlo simulation of it to determine, um, you know, just randomly erased channels with that probability. And then went through the decoder to see if it was able to correct them or not. And you can see for small enough erasure probabilities, it's able to correct them. And then it hits a threshold around 0.42, and then very rapidly goes up. And then after that, after you have an erasure probability around 0.42, it's no longer able to correct those erasures. Okay. So what I was talking about previously was so-called regular LDPC codes. Remember, the regular condition is that in the parity check matrix, all the columns have the same weight and all the rows have the same weight. And you can get reasonably good performance with a regular LDPC code. But it turns out that a irregular LDPC code can actually give you better performance. Uh, and in fact, if you want to get your know, Shannon capacity uh, approaching performance, you need to have a irregular LDPC code. Okay? So the idea with the irregular LDPC code is now the, uh, it's called the degree distribution. This is the number of edges that go into the variable nodes, which is equivalent to the number of ones in the, in the columns of the H matrix. They're, they're not constant. So whereas previously they were all equal to three, uh, now you might want some that are equal to one, some that are two, some that are three, some are four, some that might even be 20. Okay? You just want this uh, irregular distribution. And this actually gives rise to a optimization problem. The optimization problem is, okay, well, if we don't want to have uh, all our columns have the same number of ones in there, then what should the distribution be? Okay? And you can use density evolution to solve that problem, okay? So um, when you're talking about degrees, there, you need to know like a degree distribution. So um, I mean, a natural thing to say would be, okay, for um, you look at the, look at the uh, check nodes and then determine um, what the proportion of the check nodes are that have a certain degree, okay? But the way it's actually done and the, and the preferred way to do it in the LDPC literature, it's a little awkward, but it's what is the fraction of edges that touch uh, check nodes of a certain degree? And what is the fraction of edges that touch variable nodes of a certain degree? Okay. So just to clarify what I mean by that, we'll go through this as an example. Um, this is actually typical of a irregular LDPC code in, in that the check nodes all have the same degree, but the variable nodes have different degrees. Okay. So we would say that all of the edges here touch check nodes of degree three, right? All these have degree three, okay? And so, and we're using this variable rho, the fraction of edges touching degree i check nodes. So we would say 
um, rho sub 3, the subscript is the, is the degree of the edges. Rho sub 3 equals 1 means that all check nodes have degree 3. Okay? Now the variable nodes are a little different because they don't all have the same degree. Okay? And there are a total of um, 15 edges in this graph. And so we would say, okay, um, of these, there are four edges right here, one, two, three, four, four edges that touch degree one variable nodes. So we would say lambda sub one is four over 15. Okay? And then we have um, eight edges, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight edges touching uh, degree uh, two variable nodes. So we'd say that lambda sub two is eight over 15. Okay? So notice there's actually four uh, degree two uh, variable nodes, uh, but there's eight edges that touch them, two times four. Okay? So we can come up with a degree distribution like that okay, to characterize this. If we do that, then, um, then we can come up with these uh, degree distribution polynomials here, uh, rho sub x and lambda sub x. Okay, so you've got, it's just a polynomial where the exponent is, it's i minus 1, which is just 1 less than the degree, and then rho, which was the degree distribution. So for instance, uh, for this previous example, our degree distribution polynomial uh, would be rho of x is um, 1 uh, times uh, x squared, right? That's easy enough. But for lambda, for the variable nodes, this is where the irregularity usually comes in. Um, using this equation, uh, we would get, okay, we would get um, the polynomial would be um, 4 fifteenths times, uh, well, x to the 0, which is just 1. We would have 8 fifteenths uh, times x and uh, 3 fifteenths times x squared. Okay, so we get these polynomials that depend on the, on the degree distributions. But if you know the degree distributions, you can come up with, the, with these polynomials. And then this is our density evolution uh, equation. And you can prove this. It just follows from theorem on total probability. Um, if you're in Dr. Ingram's um, brand of process class, you should probably be able to handle <laughs> these types of problems. But um, now what we're doing is we're just substituting in, uh, we've got, it looks similar to our previous equation, uh, but we're, we've got these actual polynomials in here, rho and, and lambda. So where we had x, we're going to substitute in rho of 1 minus uh, epsilon. Take that whole thing, take 1 minus that, and substitute that into the lambda polynomial. Okay? That's how you handle the irregularity. So it's similar in spirit to how you uh, analyze the, the uh, regular code. Okay? And then you get, you get um, when you do this, you're going to get um, sort of an error probability, or you're going to get um, as a function of, of x here, um, you're going to get an erasure probability, okay, as a, as a function of um, what this means is this epsilon is the initial error probability. That's the error probability of the channel, or the erasure probability of the channel. And then this x is um, the erasure probability as you iterate, okay. And you get curves like this. Um, basically, what you want to do is you want to make sure so that it converges. The curves have to sort of maintain, be below this line. This is epsilon equals x. That's the convergence criteria. Okay? And so you can see here, if you have your um, erasure probability 0.5, that's too high it, because it crosses over this line. It's not going to converge. But as long as you can keep everything below that line, uh, then um, what that means is that the decoder is always improving. See, once you cross over this line, that means that the decoder actually could be going backwards and get making your erasure probability worse. Okay. So anyway, um, this, is, this is just a mathematical way. Again, this is the part that I gave to the math students, so we had to have this supremum. This is just sort of a mathematical way to state this optimization. Okay. But basically, you just want to come up with this optimization that says, as you iterate, you just want to assure that the erasure probability is always getting better right, as you, as you iterate through it. And then these conditions assure that. Okay. And then so um, there's going to exist, for a, given, for a given code, for a given degree distribution, there's going to be some threshold. We call that epsilon star. That's going to be the highest erasure probability that that code, ensemble of codes, can handle. When I say ensemble of codes, I mean all codes of that degree distribution, right? Okay, so there's going to be this threshold, okay? And then, so then the optimization problem is that you would like to choose your degree distributions, okay? So you're going to choose your degree distributions in such a way that you maximize your, uh, that, that threshold, right? 
you want to you want to maximize epsilon star. That means you're going to have a code that can handle the most number of erasures. Okay, and it's just a optimization. It's actually can be modeled as a it's a linear programming problem, and you can solve it using MATLAB's optimization toolbox, and you get some result like this. Okay, this is um, resolution's not real good. Okay, this is showing. Um, the threshold out, uh, on uh, erasure probabilities. Remember, we want this to be high. This is that epsilon star. And um, this is the um, average, or this is the average uh, row. That's the average um, check node degree distribution. And then um, we actually put a constraint on here on the maximum allowable uh, variable node uh, degree. So that'd be the maximum number of ones in any given uh, column, and that's there mostly for like a complexity consideration, and it ranges from uh, five through thirty. This is five, and this is thirty. So this says this curve here, which gives you the best performance, it's up highest, is allowing you to have uh, columns in the H matrix that have up to thirty ones in it. Okay, and that that gives you this curve, and uh, you can see you can get pretty good performance. You need a um, here's an average uh, row of around. I think that's um, eight or so, uh, but you know this this kind of gives you an idea of, of how well you can go. And so this threshold is point uh, four nine five nine six, okay, uh, for for that best code, okay. So that kind of gives you an idea of of how you would go about designing an LDPC code. And really, the critical thing there is in um, determining what the degree distribution should be, okay. And you can use density evolution to do that, and you can even do that. Uh, for an AWGN channel. There's a version of density evolution. There's also something called an exit chart, extrinsic information transfer chart, uh, which is also was popularized with turbo codes. And it's a little bit of an easier thing to use than, than density evolution. Um, and that's sometimes applied to AW, AWGN channels as well. Okay, so uh, I, I went into a lot of detail about that degree distribution uh, aspect, but I want to talk about a couple other important factors and then turn to my own research. And I think we have about 15 minutes left or something like that. So another uh, issue is, is encoding, encoding, okay? I talked about parity check matrices. Those of you that took coding theory have seen a little bit of coding theory. You're probably used to seeing generator matrices first before you see parity check matrices. And so a generator matrix is something where you can just take the message and you multiply it by G and you get the code word, okay? Now, um, the way you can get a generator matrix from an arbitrary H matrix is you can first put it into so-called systematic form. So by using a Gaussian elimination approach, you can get your H into the form of PI, where I is an identity matrix, and P is some other matrix. Okay? And then if you can do that, then your G matrix is I, P transpose. Okay? So that seems easy enough. You think that that's what you would want to do to get a generator matrix for your low density parity check code. But if you do that, what you'll find is the process of doing Gaussian elimination to get your H into this form will result almost always in a P matrix, which is not low density, but rather high density. And so your matrix multiplication is going to have, um, it's going to be a multiplication of U times a very dense matrix, which is not really uh, something that you'd want to do. So a better way to do encoding, and this is in fact what DVBS2 does, is to express your H matrix in this form where you have um, this back diagonal of ones and then everything above it is zero. And then you can do a back substitution method of encoding. And so the way it works is in this case, your first one, two, three, four, your first four bits are your data bits. Okay? So those, are, those variables are already set. And then your goal in the encoder is to just determine what the other variables are by solving the system of equations. So your first equation just says that, uh, well, bit one, uh, three, four, and five have to, be, um, have to sum to zero. Well, you know what all the other bits are except for this one. So you just set this bit, the, f the fifth bit, which is the first parity bit, uh, in such a way that this first parity check equation is, is uh, satisfied. Okay? And then you move on to the next one. Well, in the next one, you know what all the preceding uh, bits are, so you only have to pick this bit that satisfies the equation and, and so forth. So it's a back, kind of a back substitution method. And that's actually the, the uh, parity check matrix in DVBS2 actually has that kind of a structure to allow you to do that type of encoding. Okay? Um, the curves that I showed you before that kind of gave you, um, showed you how LDPC codes compared against Shannon, uh, that assumed a rather conventional receiver architecture, which is, you know, you look at the transmitter uh, side, the transmitter side you do encoding and then you do modulation, right? So it makes sense on the receiver that you do your demodulation 
and then you pass that to your decoder, and that's how it works. But it turns out that you can improve your performance if you take the output of your LDPC decoder and you pass it back to your demodulator. Okay? Use that as a priori information on your demodulator. So you would actually be using a so-called map demodulator. And a map demodulator allows you to operate with a priori knowledge of what the data bits are. You get that a priori information about the data bits from your LDPC decoder. And so you can iterate between the two. Okay? Now, granted, it is more complicated because you have to do this APSK demodulation again. Uh, but it's not really that much more uh, complicated because most of your complexity is over here in your LDPC decoder, and very little of it is on your APSK uh, demodulator. If you do that, you can actually get some performance gains. So this is some uh, results that we worked out uh, using this idea of so-called bit interleave coded modulation with iterative decoding. Iterative decoding. Bit interleave coded modulation is a mouthful, but um, it comes from the presence there is an interleaver between the code and the modulator, so it's called BICM. And the iterative decoding part is this iteration between the decoder, and, between the decoder and the demodulator. And you can see here, this is for 16 APSK for two of the code rates. We have a rate four fifths LDPC code and a rate three fourths LDPC code. And you get a gain. It's like about 0.2 to 0.3 dB. Okay? It doesn't seem like a lot, but remember, we're operating only about one to two dB away from the uh, Shannon bounds. So if you can recover another two to 0.2 to 0.3 dB, that's actually not too bad. Okay. You go to 32. Now, because 32 is a bigger constellation, you actually get there's more benefit to doing this. Uh, you can actually get more like a, oh, what do we have here? About 0 0.5, 0 0.6 dB gain just by feeding that information back from the uh, decoder back to the demodulator. Okay? So that doesn't, you, nothing's different about the standard. Uh, this is actually it's completely compliant with DVBS2 standards, just a different way of doing the demodulation. Okay? Having an integrated receiver that tries to kind of jointly do the, uh, demodulator and decoding uh, iteratively. Okay. Okay. So now we get to talk about sort of my contribution, my recent contribution uh, in the area of constellation shaping, which is um, a technique we came up with to improve the performance of the uh, DVBS2 system. Now, constellation shaping is something which has been used for years. <laughs> it's actually used a lot in wireline telephone modems, and the idea is that um, you want to intentionally transmit the lower energy signals more frequently than the higher energy sig signals. So instead of trying to transmit all your signals with equal probability, you actually want to somehow engineer a way where you're going to be transmitting the lower energy signals uh, more frequently than the higher energy signals. Okay? That is going to require an additional coding, uh, nonlinear coding, which I'll explain in order to, to do that. But in effect, what happens is um, the Blue points are a 32 APSK constellation where all the signals are picked with the same probability. We'll call that a uniform constellation. The red one is so-called shaped, and it's done in such a way that the uh, higher energy signals are transmitted less frequently than the lower energy signals. And in fact, these two constellations have the same average energy. Okay? So for the same average energy, by doing the shaping, you can actually make your signals get further apart. Of course, having signals further apart gives them better performance. right? How does this translate to the information theory? Well, if you look at a curve on this scale, it doesn't look like it does much. But if we zoom in here, you can see we can actually get about another 0.3 dB gain in performance uh, by doing this uh, shaping. Okay. All right. So how do we do the shaping? Okay. Well, what we're going to do is we're going to take our 32 APSK constellation and divide it into two subconstellations: um, a high energy subconstellation, which is the 16 points on the out outer uh, circle, and then a low energy subconstellation, which is the two inner rings, which also has 16 points. So we're going to have two subconstellations, each of, each of which has 16 points. And then, you know, when you have 32 APSK, you got five bits. Right? Each one of these signal points corresponds to five bits, and you can see the labeling there. What we're going to do is we're going to use one of those bits to select the subconstellation. Right? So um, there's, there's two subconstellations, so you can use that one bit. And um, this is the actual labeling from the standard, and it, it actually has to be the second bit. Uh, because the second bit is a one for all of the uh, all of the points on the on the outer ring, and it's a zero for all the points on the inner two rings. So that second bit is we call that a shaping bit, okay? And that's the critical part of the system. That bit has to actually pick the lower energy signals or the signals on the, the inner subconstellation more frequently than uh, the signals on the outer constellation. The other the other four bits are just going to operate as usual and just pick from the signals within the constellation with equal probability. Okay, so how do we do that? 
um, well, that shaping bit actually has to be encoded in such a way that it is zero more frequently than one. Okay? And that's going to require a code. Um, so there is going to be a little bit of an additional overhead to doing this. Um, okay? So, so um, you have to make, be careful that this overhead doesn't get to be too extreme, doesn't outweigh the benefits. But here's an example, five, three shaping codes. So there's three input bits and five uh, output bits. And here's our, our input data. This is a nonlinear code, okay? Uh, but if you take these inputs and produce those outputs, okay, these out, the output code words are, are specifically chosen to have low weight, uh, meaning f a few number of ones in them. And if you look, look at all these code words here, um, you actually see there's a lot more zeros over here than there are ones. And so what we find is that with this code, um, if you look at this, this table, there's actually 31 zeros and only nine ones. So we would say with this code, the probability of zero is 31 over 40, which is 40 total entries. The probability of one is nine over 40. Okay, so this is a shaping code. Okay, all right. So in terms of the system, we put our shaping code right here. We're going to take our uh, the output of our channel encoder. This is LDPC encoder, and then we're going to split it up. Most of the bits are just going to be used as usual, but some bit, is, some of these bits have to go through the shaping code, and then the bits that come out of the shaping code is used to pick this bit. This is the second bit. Uh, which is the one that selects from the uh, two subconstellations. The other bits we don't have to do anything to because they're just going to pick from among the points in the subconstellations. Okay, so that's sort of how it works. Uh, in terms of uh, performance, um, let's see. Actually, this let's skip over this one. Um, here's the um, here's the receiver. Um, we need to add an additional component in the receiver. This is our BICM ID receiver where we iterate between our demodulator and our decoder, like we saw before. But we also have to do our shaping decoding right here. It, it falls in place right there. Okay, so there's an additional complexity, but um, there's actually not a whole lot more complexity to doing this because those shaping codes were very small, right? That example only the the uh, the number of messages was um, there are three bits, so there's only eight different code words. So you can actually do a brute force comparison against all the code words. Um, it's not really that expensive to do that, okay? And that that's the additional uh, complexity. It's due to the uh, shaping uh, decoder, okay? So um, so some some results here. Uh, this is for uh, this is for our 32 APSK. The, the resolution is not real good, but I'll walk you through the results here. Um, Okay, so this is uh, 32 APSK with a, um, a spectral efficiency of three bits per symbol. Now, of course, with 32 APSK, you could be operating at five bits per symbol, uh, but you need a lot of energy to do that. So we're going to operate at three bits per symbol. If you don't use, um, if you don't use uh, shaping, then that translates to a rate three fifths um, code, three fifths code. Okay. Now, the interesting thing is when you use shaping, um, that shaping code actually induces a rate loss. And you actually need to compensate for that rate loss by using a higher rate LDPC code, just to keep things fair. So uh, working through all the math here, if your shaping code has a rate of 1 half, and so it's an example of a rate 1 half shaping code that we used is 6-3. Uh, it takes three, three uh, input bits and shapes it to 6 bits. That's a rate 1 half shaping code. Then your LDPC code actually has to have a rate of 2 thirds to have the same spectral efficiency. Okay? So you're actually going to lose a little bit of performance from the LDPC code. But as long as you can gain that back or more through shaping, then you should be OK. All right, so here's your, um, this is the standard system. This is no shaping, no BICM ID, nothing. You're right there. If you use a BICM ID, this is, we saw this result before, you actually get like a, a, a gain here. This was, a, in this case, it's about point, uh, point 0.3 dB or something like that. And then if you um, use um, shaping, then you get all the way over to here. And actually, this is for different shaping codes. So we've got um, 4, 4, 2, 6, 3, and um, 12, 6. Uh, these get more complicated, uh, more complex, because the codes are bigger. This one seems to be kind of a sweet spot. That's the um, 6, 3 shaping code. So there's only eight, 8 shaping code words, 2 to the 3. So for very little additional complexity, and if you compare uh, this point to that point, um, the total gain there, it's, it's about a whole dB, you know, when you, when you combine all those um, gains. Okay, so um, we even have five minutes in case you want to ask me questions, but the conclusion here is that uh, if you use an irregular LDPC code, you can achieve a capacity, um, and um, you can, you can um, use density evolution to predict the performance. 
Uh, the key there is picking the right degree distributions. Okay? Actually, I have to admit, I had a different set of conclusions that didn't get propagated. I think I needed to typeset. This is LaTeX, for those of you who didn't notice, and I think I needed to typeset it one more time. Um, but, but basically, uh, my conclusions were that DVBS2 is able to achieve its higher performance gains through the combination of APSK modulation, LDPC coding, uh, using that tight raised raise cosine roll-off filter. Right? Um, we can improve performance uh, by doing things like BICMID. Right? or by using this constellation shaping idea. Uh, idea. Okay? Um, another thing that we want to do uh, for future work, I, I don't have it down here, but uh, for future work, uh, the next thing that we're working on, and we have some preliminary results, is we're going to apply density evolution to our shaped system. So the results that I showed you, that was actually using the codes in the DVB-S2 standard. We didn't change anything. All we did was we added this uh, you know, constellation shaping idea to it. Uh, but we can actually improve things. We found that we can improve things maybe another 0.1 to 0.2 dB by going back to the LDPC code in the standard and re-optimizing it uh, with respect to the shaping that we're using. So it, it changes the way that we do the optimization. So with that in mind, <laughs> I'm done. And we even have a, if, if you don't mind, we have a couple minutes here if you have any questions. Yes. On your constellation stuff, when mm -hmm. you're talking about the rate, mm -hmm. um, wherever that was. Oh. Here? No. No, the, Early the, on. You had with the DB, uh -huh. not too far back. Oh, too far back. Yeah, your, your constellation. Oh, my constellation. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There was a table at the top. No. no. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah, with the error yeah. rate, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So th that rate, is that just the rate over the channel, or is that... The, the rate from end to end, including encoding and decoding. Okay, so in this, in this example, the end to end rate for all of these curves is three bits per transmitted symbol. Okay, so right. three bits per symbol. Okay. okay, so the way you can do it is if you, um, if you just used a standard LDPC code, uh, that's a rate three fifths LDPC code. And then, so it's the, the, the end to end rate is three fifths times five because it's 32 APSK, so you get five bits per symbol. Okay, but then what I, what I was saying here is that um, if you use shaping, you actually, because the shaping code has a certain rate, uh, but not all the bits are shaped, only one out of five is shaped, um, then you have to lower the uh, rate of the, or I'm sorry, increase the rate of the uh, LDPC code to have the same end to end uh, rate. Okay, and I, I don't know this, if this follow on question makes any sense because it might not understand everything that you went through, but um, the, the code that you had is not a prefix, free code, mm -hmm. right? So that would obviously limit your overall through rate. Do you have any opportunity to, where you could mm -hmm. maybe make that better or by leveraging something that's prefix Okay, free? so the question was about prefix free codes, but prefix free codes, that tends to be a concept more for uh, source coding. Right. And the issue here is um, the these codes all have a fixed length oh, to them, right? right? Okay. So, so they're not variable length, so it's easy to synchronize yeah, with them, right? Yeah. right? They always have uh, 64, 800 bits, right? right? right. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you very much. <laughs>